for our final session of the afternoon in what's been, I think, a really fascinating day. Um, uh, my name is Sally Moyle. I'm an honorary associate professor at the uh, Australian National University Gender Institute, and uh, I'm also the vice president of the National Foundation for Australian Women and um, a range of other roving feminist hats that I wear. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank Margaret and Emma for organising this fabulous conference. It's been just great and, uh, and for inviting me to participate in it. And um, I'd like to join others in acknowledging the country on which we're meeting around Australia. In my case, I'm sitting on Nyarago land uh, and paying my respects to elders past and present. Uh, it's a really exciting panel, I think, this afternoon that we have with uh, a range of academics um, and government representatives who are able to talk to us about the future of work and where we're heading. Um, we've, we've spoken a lot today about the context for where Australian families are sitting in relation to their work and paid work and family obligations. And uh, uh, we now have the opportunity to think about where we might be heading into the future, particularly in the context of COVID. And as we all know, um, COVID has, expo has exposed and exacerbated inequalities as all crises do. Every time there's any kind of crisis, um, e existing inequalities are always exacerbated because those with least power are least able to respond effectively. Um, but the COVID pandemic uh, is broader in its effects. It has walked into every part of our lives in terms of paid work, um, with access to employment, with access to, to unemployment benefits, to levels of employment and unemployment and, and under, particularly underemployment rates, um, as well as how paid work is done. And we've spoken a lot, of course, about how families are managing the working from home revolution and where it might, I'd be really interested to hear from our speakers this afternoon about where that might lead and whether we're planning to just snap back to the way it was, as our Prime Minister said early in the pandemic, or whether we might be able to think a bit bigger into the future. Uh, and of course, it's affected our caring roles for parents of school age kids and for preschool kids. It's been really difficult. And we've heard some of those discussions today about how difficult it has been. For parents of older kids like myself, I've got a, a daughter in, at university in Sydney. Um, we've often spent a lot more time coaching our kids through some of the difficulties and helping them to learn resilience in this really trying time. And for others of us, it's been really, it's really fractured our ability to care with people who have been separated from family members who, for whom they have caring obligations and, and how we manage that feeling about care, the notions of care that we face through the pandemic have been um, absolutely um, rejigged, re if you like. And of course, the whole conversation we're having about vaccination or non-vaccination masks or no masks talks to us about how we feel about caring as a community as well. And who cares for whom and who should care for whom. So I think that this pandemic has really exposed for us where our inequalities are. And it really does give us an opportunity to think about where we're going uh, with this. And as June Oscar said so presciently at the beginning of the day, care is what makes the world go around. It's not money, it is care. And that's really clear to us, I think, through this pandemic. Um, so do we just snap back to where we were? Do we just go back to the way things were? But surely we've seen some glimmers of how we can do things differently and how can we pres preserve these changes so that we can do things be better into the future, reduce inequalities and make uh, our communities, our families and even our economy work better for us all if we've got greater um, equality. So um, without further ado, I'd just like to introduce, first of all, Mary Wooldridge. Um, she is the Honourable Mary Wooldridge, is the Director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Um, Mary's been in that position since May last year, so I'm really keen to hear uh, uh, from you, Mary, about where your new data that came out yesterday are up to. Um, and Mary builds on this position coming to us as a member of the Victorian Parliament for a long time, where she served as a minister in many of the portfolios, including mental health, family and community services and women's portfolios. Um, we're really lucky to have you here today, as well as as the Director of Wajia, Mary, and really um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, wonderful to be here with everyone today and with the, the panel. Very much looking forward to it. I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge and pay my respects to the uh, elders from the many man, lands that we meet from around Australia. I come um, from Wurundjeri country in Melbourne. 
um, and yeah, pay my respects to elders uh, past, present and emerging. Um, I thought I'd take the opportunity today and um, Temi's going to help me with my uh, sharing my the screen, her screen um, with the presentation uh, the slides that I have today. But I wanted to take the opportunity, as you mentioned, to, to share hot off the press um, the, the latest uh, parental leave information from uh, that we released yesterday uh, from our annual scorecard um, and uh, take everyone through that because while it's a specific slice in terms of where we're up to on the relationship between parenting and work, uh, I think it's very um, important in the context of, of the relationship between parenting and work and how that's viewed uh, both from, from parents and also um, from employers. I thought I'd take a minute first of all, Tell me if you can go to the next uh, slide, just for those of you who um, are less familiar with the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Um, we're a federal statutory body. Um, our role is to promote and improve gender equality and we do that by conducting an annual census of employers who have more than 100 or more staff. Um, and they uh, lodge information with us every year in relation to a range of gender equality indicators. Um, we then take that information and obviously use that um, in context, provide information to them in terms of how their individual companies are performing and, and their benchmarks and comparisons to industry and across the board. Um, we develop tools and resources uh, to help companies um, take action in relation to gender equality. And our latest uh, census covers 4.2 million non-public sector employees and 11,000 employers. Um, and the good news is, is the federal government's committed to the federal public sector reporting. And now states and territories have also made an in-principle agreement to report as well, which will add um, somewhere close to um, about another 1.8 million employees, uh, meaning we're covering close to 60% of the workforce when, um, when we include the public sectors as well. Next slide, thanks, Tammy. Tammy. Um, our gender equality indicators um, are, uh, you know, not surprising. Uh, gender composition of the workforce, governing bodies, uh, pay and remuneration, uh, flexible arrangements and policies to support a uh, range of caring responsibilities, how employers consult and uh, sex-based harassment and discrimination. Just out of interest and in a broader context, uh, that final one, we uh, actually collect very little information at this point, but a respect at work uh, recommendation has um, recommended we collect a lot more information. So um, we will over coming years be expanding the information we collect um, from companies on, on that issue as well, which is obviously um, very important and very topical. Um, and we use our uh, data resource, uh, our data set uh, to conduct analysis and research and we partner with a lot of organisations, um, universities and so on in terms of, uh, you know, that, that um, data as a, as a source of uh, information and insights about what's happening. So in the context of COVID, um, tell me if you can uh, flick to the next slide. Um, I think it's important to, to first of all, uh, just put some, some context. Um, we know that COVID had a disproportionate um, impact on women in terms of caring responsibilities. And, you know, in many ways it became the dual burden of uh, caring responsibilities and also um, uh, work and trying to, to juggle the two. Because while everyone stepped up in terms of the non-paid work, um, women obviously stepped up significantly more. And in, in some ways, if anything, it entrenched some of those stereotypes uh, in terms of traditional roles, while um, you know men, men did do a little bit more. But I think what we're seeing with the parental leave data that I'm about to take you through um, is that uh, there's some, some hope on the horizon um, because we know that when men take parental leave, households establish a more equitable division of unpaid work and care. Um, and so shifting that stereotype um, is, is, I think, absolutely critical to, to where we want to head in the future. So what our latest uh, census, and this is the data for last year, showed is that now 60% of all employers are offering uh, paid parental leave. Um, and 
of that, 91% of them, so it's about 55%, are offering it in a gender neutral way, um, both to men and women. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, it's a, a very positive response. And in fact, um, you know, access is dependent on size uh, and industry. Um, and uh, on average, it's about you know, just under 11 weeks it's offered uh, and 2.3 weeks for, for secondary carers leave. Thing that's interesting though, in terms of size, um, and if we could go to the next next slide, if that's possible, please, Terry. Um, you can see here the size of the employer and whether they're likely to offer paid parental leave. So in terms of reading the charts, and this also shows the shift over time, large companies with over 5,000 employees um, have over the last eight years uh, made an eight percent increase, a nine percent increase in terms of offering um, paid parental leave. Interestingly, within that though, uh, many have shifted. While they offered paid parental leave, it was maternity leave, and many have shifted within that to a gender neutral form of it. So while the nine percent is a small number in the context of the other comparisons, uh, there's shifts happening within that that are. Um, you know, changing cultures and, and changing expectations. Um, what I'm very positive about here is that if you see for companies uh, from the 500 to 999 stage, the 21% increase over the last eight years is that companies, it's not only the big companies that think they can afford it, but more so those medium sized companies are seeing that this is really important, not only as a commitment to their employees, but also as a, um, you know, a retention tool and an attraction tool and a mechanism to, you know, commit to, to their staff and a big growth in the offering of parental leave um, for those medium size companies. Next slide, thanks, Tammy. Um, so across the board, so 40% of companies aren't offering it, but on average it's seven to 12 weeks. Um, best practice employers are offering um, uh, at 26 weeks and, and we've seen a number of examples of companies um, talking to that and, and we see that not only we want companies, small companies offering paid parental leave, we actually want that shift up, you know, through that chart so, so more weeks are offered and more flexibly. Um, so, so there's an opportunity there and a, and a challenge to employers in terms of where they need to go. Next slide, thanks, Timmy. Um, it's also more likely that we'll have it, not surprisingly, in female dominated industries. Um, and I'll get you to flick straight to the next slide, which has got the numbers, um, if you love numbers like me. Um, you know, male dominated industries, 50% of them don't offer paid parental leave at all versus, uh, only, you know, only 25%, 24% of female dominated industries. Um, so very clear messages here about opportunities for, for male dominated industries to shift. Interestingly, um, the industries that have the lowest level of uh, primary carers leave offered are the ones with highly casualised workforces, retail industry, uh, accommodation services, administrative services. Um, so while they're mixed industries, uh, they do have highly casualised workforces and they don't follow through with these, these policies um, as well. So it tends to be women, once again, who are missing out um, at multiple levels. Um, and across the board, quite interestingly, different different levels of um, amount of time that's offered. Um, and, you know, once again, uh, it's it's interesting. The female uh, dominated industries, while lower overall, uh, those who are still just offering maternity leave at the higher level. Um, if you flip to the next slide, this was um, really some of the most significant um, numbers that we had to that issue of men taking carers leave. So, of the of the the people that took leave, twelve percent were men. Uh, this is primary carers leave and 88% women. Um, this is a low number, but what is significant is it's up from 6.5% the year before. So a doubling in just one year um, in, a, in the context of a set of data that shifts slowly over time is quite a significant reflection of a, a change in attitude and views. And I also see it as very positive that 20% of all managers who took leave were men because we know that men need to model behaviours 
um, for other men, for their peers and for the people who work for them um, in as, as a mechanism to reduce those gender stereotypes and to reduce the stigma around choices about taking um, parental leave. And this goes for flexible leave, um, of course, as well. Um, there's been studies that have shown, of course, that uh, men are more likely to have uh, both parental leave and flexible leave refused. Um, and, you know, it's these sort of, you know, managers stepping up and, and modelling it um, where we can actually uh, change attitudes and, uh, and and the processes and policies and that are put in place um, in relation to it. So um, big growth, um, some, some interesting leadership um, and a real opportunity to shift attitudes and behaviours. And as I said at the beginning, the translation of men taking parental leave in terms of that mix of unpaid work and care in the home um, is quite significant um, in terms of how this sort of behaviour that we're seeing, you know, in these statistics will, will translate in terms of the relationship uh, going forward. Thanks to the next slide. Um, we did ask companies, those 40% who don't have parental leave, why? Um, and about half of them say they think the government scheme is sufficient. Um, interestingly, some of those who pay parental leave actually just pay a top up between the government scheme and an individual's um, pay. So, you know, I, I see this interesting while we'd obviously like a, a full-blown scheme, um, you know, we're advocating to companies that there's a way to into parental leave if you're not offering it where you can start to put your toe in the water with perhaps, you know, paying the gap or paying some superannuation or whatever it might be um, as, as a way to get into the scheme and then, of course, obviously expand over time. Only a small proportion are developing it and obviously, you know, in, insufficient resources, expertise, that's where we see we've got an opportunity to work with those companies to um, help them with that resources and expertise to, to um, shift, uh, shift their policies. We can have the next slide. The other question that we asked for the first time um, is whether uh, superannuation is paid on uh, parental leave. And of course, we know that there's um, a big uh, gender superannuation gap, um, depending on whose numbers you believe, 20, 30%, maybe even more. Um, and, you know, this is a reflection of time out of the workforce and uh, underpayment of women over an extended period of time um, through careers. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting, uh, we found, we were, you know, pleasantly surprised with the numbers that 81% of employers are paying super on their parental leave. Um, and that's the sum of the 74 and the seven. There's 7% who are actually paying it on the un unpaid leave or essentially the government funded parental leave um, in terms of um, paying those superannuation for their employees. Um, so, so good number, you know, positive results. Once again, an opportunity for further advocacy, those who aren't paying it, but also um, there's the opportunity to pay on unpaid leave um, to address the gap. Um, so just over to the last slide, if you can, can tell me, thanks. Uh, oh, no, that, the super was the last slide. So the, the other thing I was just going to comment on is uh, flexible leave. Now, we haven't released all our, our flexible leave data is coming out um, on Friday, so we're a little bit a, a ahead. But essentially what we're saying, seeing is an increase once again in companies that have um, formal uh, flexible leave policies but particularly informal flexible leave. So we know because of COVID, uh, companies have to, had to react um, quickly in terms of being responsive to the, the situation. Um, many have uh, significantly enhanced flexible leave policies that are informally available. And they also report a very significant increase in approval of flexible um, leave policies um, that have been requested. Um, the big growth in informal um, flexible leave policies have been in flexible hours of work, telecommuting, remote learning, not surprisingly, uh, and things like time in lieu. So there's, there's good signs once again, when you look at the combination of flexible leave and parental leave as mechanisms that recognise um, employees uh, are balancing and juggling um, caring responsibilities, other personal responsibilities, and their work and employers having confidence in their, their employees to, to get their work done and manage those responsibilities 
in a flexible way um, or by taking some leave um, in you know maybe a flexible way or or for a period of time um, there's there's good signs I think in terms of um, the outlook for for what's to come so I'll leave it there so we can hear from the other panelists but I hope that some of that data would be um, very useful context for the conversation that we're having today thanks Sally Thanks, Mary. That was a fabulous rocketing through of the uh, of the data. Um, I wonder if if there's a couple. There's a, the question if, um, in the Q and A that it relates to the specifics. We might just deal with that first, given that we do have some time. And I also have a question uh, just in that space. And the question is, um, I think your 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 data collection is calendar calendar year or financial year. It uh, companies report from between one April and thirty one March. If you if you want right. to be specific, so right. um, uh, and I think I think that was original part of the legislation so that it avoided into financial year and those sorts of things. Uh, so that's right. yes, so, that's, so that's the that. period yeah. that it covers um, for twenty twenty one. Right for 2021, so it was right. It was right through the middle of the lockdown and things, and so the right. uh, can't wait to see the, the data on Friday. But the increases in flexibility are they significant enough? Do you think that they really do reflect the, the changes around um, the COVID situation, or do you think a lot of that was done informally in addition to those formal requests? Yeah, so, so what the data shows is the formal um, increase just continues its trajectory of, of slow increase over the years mm. um, and mm. it comes through in the informal, that the, the informal rates um, are much higher than they have been um, and that's, that, that's the reaction. Now, the, the opportunity, of course, is to translate those informal agreements um, for uh, employers now as, as people return yeah. to the office soon into their yeah. formal policies um, and enable that to happen. Yes. Thank you. Um, and we've got a question from Christy Barlow in relation to paid parental leave and paid paternity leaves asking, are these men just taking the basics two weeks of PPL? Do you know? Are they... Um, how are we looking with the men taking their, their two weeks of dad and partner's pay? So um, this the, the data that I've presented relates to primary care. So with the average of 11 or just under 10.8 weeks. So this is the yeah. primary care leave. For secondary carers leave, and we, we advocate for the removal of a distinction between primary and secondary, um, as well as the removal between the distinction between um, men and women taking primary carers leave. So there's a... a a number of layers there. Um, secondary leave is, you know, 96, I think from my memory, 96% of it is taken by men um, and the average is about, you know, two and a half weeks. So um, the, the data on the 12% and the 20% of managers relates to primary care, which is why I think it's so positive. Yeah. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, we might move on to our next speaker then, and I'd, I'd like to introduce everybody to Cameron Rolls. Cameron is a uh, senior lecturer in um, at the ANU and is a labour law specialist. And I'd like to ask Cameron, would you like to talk to us for tell us what your thoughts are about uh, how we can change the future of work to be more gender equal? Yeah, Thanks. thank you so much, Sally. Um, and I just wanted to thank the organisers of the conference uh, for allowing me to speak on the panel. It's a great privilege to be here and to have this opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, well done, Mary. A, a really good presentation and, and terrific energy. I'm aiming to replicate it. I know that this is the hard shift of the day when, or, well, it's perhaps not as hard as straight after lunch, um, but it's the second hardest shift of the day, I guess, when everybody's a bit tired and, um, and coming towards the end of proceedings. So I'll do my best to, to keep this lively and, and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, the questions and discussion that follow uh, once all panellists have finished. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Gambri people on whose lands the ANU uh, is situated and, and from where I'm speaking to you today. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also just like to acknowledge that sovereignty to their land has never been ceded and that this was and always will be Aboriginal land. In this brief presentation, I'd like to address three aspects of work and parenting after COVID-19. 
The first one is the labour market, in my view, is experiencing once in a century changes, which bring, uh, or sorry, which both emphasise certain fault lines and issues which existed in the labour market prior to the pandemic, but also it gives hope for a labour market which more works more effectively for both employees and at least some employees. And I'll come back and amplify that in a moment. I'd also like to comment in particular on the issue of how our laws do, and perhaps more importantly, do not support the management of work and parental responsibilities. And finally, give some suggestions for ways in which the law could respond to deal with the changing labour market and parental uh, responsibilities post COVID-19. So that's the format of my presentation. They're the, the three things that I'd like to cover. And I'll just start off by explaining to you what I mean by changes in the labour market that have either been um, uh, existing prior to COVID-19 and which were accelerated by COVID-19 or alternatively, um, which really arose out of the COVID-19 crisis. So the labour market, in my view, has changed quite profoundly during the pandemic. Um, and of course, the reasons for that are ones that we're all familiar with, and I'm not going to go through those. But these changes emphasised, in my view, existing issues in the labour market, things like precarious employment. So what we mean by that is approximately one in four employees work as casuals, as well as who workers who work as independent contractors. And there's approximately one in every 10 Australian workers who works as an independent contractor. And this precarity means that workers in industries with high concentrations of precarious workers, and I'm thinking here about industries like hospitality, retail, et cetera, um, these workers were hit extremely hard by COVID-19 lockdowns and the subsequent recovery for them has been really slow. Okay, so if you think about um, uh, the local shops and, and restaurants and, all, and the like, you'll notice that a lot of those um, workers are only trickling back into those industries. Um, Prior to the pandemic, major disruptors to work, in my view, involved things like automation. Of course, precariousness was a, a factor. Um, and of course, things like international supply uh, chains and trade links were also um, a very big factor. So things like the just-in-time supply chain model have all come to, um, you know, in many ways depend on. Now, interesting research conducted by private consultancy McKinsey highlights the fact that jobs which were which required people working in close physical proximity to each other were the most disrupted during the pandemic so things like medical care personal care nails and hairdressers and uh, customer facing and service roles things like retail hospitality and of course the travel industry if you think about airlines and what happened to airlines during the pandemic by contrast work which could be performed um, uh, primarily in the home was the least disrupted during the pandemic. Now, worldwide, approximately a third of workers in developed economies fit within that second category, the work that can be performed at home. We're talking largely office work, computer work, things like that. Um, and that sector, that, that work that can be performed at home, that white collar work, is by far the largest employer grouping in developing in developed economies. Similarly, jobs in construction and the like, which were performed often outdoors, also suffered um, um, also suffered some disruptions, but not as much disruption as um, the other jobs that I've pointed out. So, what does all this mean? Academics, as well as private consultancies like McKinsey and Gartner and others, highlight that working from home and virtual meetings are likely to remain a feature of the workplace, at least um, um, for a little while after um, the uh, pandemic uh, subsides, and particularly in knowledge-based white-collar roles. And some have predicted that we could see four to four, four to five times the level of remote work after the pandemic has dissipated than what we saw prior to the pandemic. So that's a huge shift 
If that turns out to be true, that'll be a huge shift. Now, of course, um, it's difficult to make any predictions during COVID-19, isn't it? I mean, we've got a, a situation where, you know, pretty much um, any prediction that anybody cares to make in relation to the pandemic tends to um, not quite work out as people would <laughs> would think. So, you know, I don't think it's a, a given that, that working from home or working remotely is going to increase four to five times when compared to pre-pandemic levels, but certainly attitudes from major corporates and the like seems to suggest that there will be much greater work from home or work remotely than, um, than ever occurred prior to the pandemic. Likewise, e-commerce um, is likely to be a feature of, of um, our working lives moving forward. That'll have knock-on effects, or these two features will have knock-on effects for industries like commercial travel, for example, um, food and retail and beverages, and particularly industries in large cities, if you think about your cafes and things like that. Secondly, I think it's likely that automation and artificial intelligence will continue to be developed, particularly in the context of work, which is, um, required to be performed in close proximity um, uh, to others. So think about things like warehousing and distribution and the like. Um, and this is picked up by research. Um, um, there was a survey of uh, CEOs from across various white collar industries, all of, or, or many of whom said, we're gonna be investing more in AI, AI and automation. Thirdly, I think it's likely that job growth, growth, at least in the short term, will be concentrated in high skilled, higher wage jobs. There's a lot of competition for talent uh, in these particular types of roles, particularly in Australia, where unemployment currently sits at 4.2%. So I think we're likely to see a lot of competition in that part of the market. Um, in my view, it's likely that employees in high wage, um, uh, jobs uh, moving forward post pandemic will have more bargaining power than they had prior to the pandemic. Um, and the reason I think that is positive experience with, during the pandemic with things like remote working, combined with the desire of many of these types of employees to have a greater sense of work life balance is likely to encourage employers to agree to greater flexibility for employees in these wage, high wage roles. By contrast, the precarity of employment faced by employees in low wage, low skilled roles is likely in my view to mean that their bargaining power will either be about the same or could even go backwards a little bit. Um, and this will mean that their access to an ability put, to push for improvements to working conditions will be very limited. So we're really seeing um, two different tranches here in my view. Excuse me. Um, one possible counterweight to this trend for low paid workers, in my view, is the large amount of opportunities for work in the paid care sector. And in making this point, I'm thinking of schemes like the National Disability Insurance Scheme and schemes like My Age Care, which at least for relatively low skilled care workers have low barriers of entry and are generally better remunerated than other forms of precarious work. And while there's definitely issues in these sectors, um, I think that it does have some potential to offset um, some of the slow recovery in lower paid jobs. Um, I now wanna just highlight a couple of the effects of all of this of the scene that I've just set for you on work and parenthood. Um, so I won't go into a detail about the impacts of COVID-19 on working from home and parental responsibilities. The reason I won't do that is that many of us in, I suspect, have actually experienced this for ourselves. It's probably a topic that we're all too familiar with. And certainly if you're interested, there's been some research done by some colleagues of mine here at the ANU who talk about, for example, the stresses on homeschooling during the pandemic and the stress that that's placed on balancing work and family responsibilities. So it's important to, to remember that working from home was only an option for those employees who performed predominantly 
<coughs> excuse me, computer-based work. So some employees missed out altogether on working from home and were sustained by government support. But for those who could, um, um, uh, re for those who could work at home, research by Thornton, along with others, highlights some real trends that are worth thinking about. Some employees felt they could better balance work and family life when they were working at home. Yet almost all of them found that it was a difficult balance to achieve and some employers were more accommodating than others. Now, unfortunately, our labour laws aren't strong in promotable, promoting flexible work practices or family and caring responsibilities. As many of you will know, the national employment standards um, ensures um, that an employee has a right to request flexible working arrangements but only um, with respect to some children and others. And it's up to the employer as to whether or not to agree to these requests. Now, I should also make the point that only some employees can request um, uh, and there's no enforceable right to uh, respond if an employer rejects your request or, or, or no, no enforceable right to, to challenge the rejection per se. Likewise, anti-discrimination laws can, at times, protect against discriminatory behaviour, but they do not afford employees a right to flexible work. Our laws aren't keeping pace, in my view, with the needs of families um, in juggling their working and caring responsibilities. In my view, there's practical steps which governments could do to fix this particular situation. One option would be to give employees a right of review if an employer denies a request for flexible working arrangements. Now, I'll talk more about that. If people want to ask me to expand on my thoughts on that during question time, I'm happy to do that. Um, um, but I just wanted to put it on the table that I think one option would be to create uh, an enforceable right of review so that a, a flexible working arrangements could be challenged more easily by employees. Um, and in my view, employees' capacity to challenge managerial prerogative in this way would be a very valuable starting point. There's also other areas in which the law could do more to assist employees juggling work and family responsibilities. Giving workers greater job and financial security would help alleviate, um, in my view, um, some of the problems that's posed by precarious employment or precarious work. Um, uh, we know, of course, that um, the precarious employees bore the, bore the scourge of job losses during the pandemic, and we know that governments had to step in to effectively prop up their income so that employees weren't coming to work when they were sick. And so um, some reform in this area would be incredibly valuable. Unfortunately, recent amendments to the Fair Work Act concerning casual employees have continued to entrench the notion of the long-term casual. And the recent uh, Rosato and personnel contracting decisions um, by the High Court have emphasised the primacy of written contracts in relation to employment arrangements. So unfortunately, these develops, developments, in my view, will make it less likely for casual employees to achieve levels of financial security enjoyed by their high-wage uh, counterparts, meaning that surviving can often take precedence over quality family time. So in closing, it's my view that it would be desirable for the law to respond positively to the desire of both employers and employees to achieve greater flexibility. And although both employers and employees want this flexibility, they want it for different reasons. Um, but it's my hope that whatever the motivations, the pandemic will drive both employers and employees to provide greater flexibility and that this might help society as a whole to appreciate that the importance of work and employment is not as an economic exchange, but as an essential aspect of a person's self um, as well as their livelihood and that of their families. Thanks so much, Sally.
Fabulous. Thanks, Cam. And thanks for a couple of um, very practical suggestions for how we can go forward with this. I mean, change is always hard, but there's some, you know, sometimes small steps are the first, as, as a first step, are, are really important. So thank you for that. That's okay. Um, we might move. We might move straight on to um, hear from Ariadne Roman now, um, and it's great to have Ariadne here because Ariadne is a professor at um, the Crawford School and uh, has actually got an ARC Discovery Grant focusing particularly on the future of work. So uh, we'd love, I can't wait to hear from you, Ariadne. Thanks, over to you. Thank you, Sally, and I will share my screen. Hopefully it works. Okay, so thanks for that intro, Sally. I will try and be quick and hopefully quicker than the quicker than 10 minutes as well. Uh, when we were asked to speak on this panel, I thought, and it was about the future of work, I thought it was probably easiest to speak about a current project I'm working on. We're about halfway through this linkage project on designing gender equality into the future of work. And I'm working with some colleagues at the University of Sydney and here at ANU. And what I want to do is just have a bit of a quick snapshot about surveys that we ran in September, October of last year when uh, New South Wales, Victoria and ACT were all under lockdown. So in our study, we are contrasting workers, legal workers, so workers in the law with workers in retail broadly defined to also include fast food and distribution. We were interested in contrasting these two sectors of work because we're contrasting professional with uh, what is generally frontline and we're found to be essential workers. So a lot of our retail workers in our sample work in supermarkets. So that was definitely essential work during, during the last couple of years of COVID. Uh, women are the majority of workers in both the legal and retail industries now. These um, industries are also undergoing technological change. We can see the automation of simple law tasks, the emergence of new law practices with billing and so on in the legal sector. And in retail, there's uh, quite a significant shift around technological change, automation um, through on, well, automation within picking and in warehouses, as well as the use of technology within retail stores and obviously the growth of online shopping. I know I did way too much online shopping when I was um, in lockdown in Sydney, a habit I'm hoping that I'm starting to break. But in these industries, human work is still core. And we really sort of saw that within the crisis in supply debates over Christmas and January to, to the rapid spread of Omicron. So there was a real debate about what it meant to be a worker, uh, particularly in retail and in, in supply. But the other contrast worth making is that during the lockdowns, lawyers were able to work overwhelmingly from home as Cameron was talking about, whereas very few workers in retail had the luxury of working from home. A lot of them were on, front, on the front line also, um, or working in warehouses. So we're also at risk of um, catching COVID as well. But I've mainly been working so far and analyzing our retail data, but because I was invited to speak at a um, college of law, talk today, I've gone back and looked at some of our data on, on lawyers too. Um, yeah, and now I'll actually move to the right mode. Uh, so our lawyers were um, the majority women, 58% were women on average. Um, they were an older sample. They're sort of in their kind of 40s, which is probably older than typical members of the New South Wales Law Society who tend to be a little bit younger. But what we found, we asked them about how remote work and hybrid work was affecting them during the pandemic. And you can see that a majority agreed that their workload intensified and also that their working hours increased while they were working in the hybrid mode. And women were more likely than men, significantly more likely than men to say that their working hours and in, there'd been an intensification of their workload. In terms of their interactions with clients and colleagues, we asked them if um, remote or hybrid work had actually improved their interactions with their clients and their colleagues. Um, we can see that 47% disagreed that their, um, they had improved interactions and 62% strongly disagreed that their interactions with um, their colleagues were improved by working from home. So clearly that had an effect on the nature of their work, both with their working in teams, with colleagues, but also working with clients. But here we find very little difference between male and female lawyers. 
We asked similar questions of the change, changes in work of our retail workers. Retail is a significant um, proportion of the Australian workforce, at least 11%. Um, both Cameron and Mary in their talks have talked about retail workers. We've also um, alluded to them earlier today in that they're quite particular. It's a highly casualised sector of the workforce. In our sample, 38% were um, casual and didn't have access to sort of uh, to predominantly to sick leave and paid annual leave. And that compares to about 23% national, nationally of workers who are casual. Again, it's a 61% women, but also quite a significant proportion of workers in retail are under 30. And, and generally, we were seeing them being classified throughout the pandemic as being essential workers who were at the, at the front line. So we asked our retail workers a series of questions about how they were affected and their working conditions were affected during the pandemic. So we found that nearly a majority had either lost hours or had felt a decrease in the security of their job. And we know that particularly in, uh, in different waves and different sections of the country, depending on whether or not they're in lockdown or under lo uh, not in lockdown, stores were, some retail stores were closing uh, and some people were losing their jobs and hours became a lot more variable for a lot of people. We also see that there's a difference here in that women were experiencing more insecurity and losing hours than male workers. Uh, we also were interested about the kind of mental health and stress-based effects of what was happening during the pandemic. Uh, retail workers were at the forefront of asking people to do check-ins into stores, to policing the wearing of masks, uh, and that sort of engagement at first hand with customers. And we found that 61% agreed that this was stressful for them, enforcing that kind of COVID-19 compliance during the pandemic. We also saw that a majority increase, uh, felt an increase in customer abuse during the time as well. And there were quite a few headline stories about these, um, these kinds of interactions that people in, in a lot of shops were facing. And again, women were significantly more likely than men to experience uh, this kind of um, stress at, in their, within their workplaces. But what's kind of important is I've been doing more analysis with this particular data. And while we see these clear gender differences, it's actually a bit more about the nature of the workforce itself in that those people who faced increasing economic insecurity, either through their actual work or through losing hours, um, it was much more likely to be affected by whether or not they were casual workers and whether or not they were living in a state under lockdown than um, their gender background alone. Whereas the stress from enforcing COVID compliance and particularly customer abuse were much more significantly felt by those workers on the front line and by, and by women. We also found in, the, in this analysis that retail workers aged over 50 were significantly less likely to be affected by any of these changes in working conditions during the pandemic. So this is something that a very particular workforce, young, women, casual. But I also dug into our data a bit more and we'd ask people about caring responsibilities at work since that's the topic of what we're looking at today. Uh, and the majority of our um, sample of lawyers had caring responsibilities broadly defined. This can include both um, caring for children, but also for um, other um, dependents such as adults and in your household and parents and so on. Uh, whereas a lot less of our retail workers um, have caring responsibilities. So again, probably because it's a younger um, workforce in general. Um, but we were also interested in asking them about how they felt about the um, opportunities that are given to people with caring responsibilities within their industry. And you can see in the chart on the left that a majority of both male and female lawyers uh, agree that those with caring responsibility, uh, sorry, disagree that those with caring responsibilities are given the same opportunities at work, but women are much more likely to, um, to see this as a problem. Uh, whereas when we contrast this different kind of question, not measuring exactly the same thing, but tailored for the industry, when we ask retail workers about um, whether or not 
workers with caring responsibilities are given access to secure and stable rosters that suit their needs. Uh, we find that most people agree that they are and that there are no gender differences. And so part of what thinking about this is kind of interesting in the kind of generational change that is possibly going on, that contrast between how we understand um, the intersection of care and responsibilities and work in different, for, different jobs. So most lawyers are working full time and they're working full time and trying to manage their caring responsibilities and also their career aspirations. Whereas the vast majority of our retail workers are casual or part time because they're already doing that balancing work between their caring responsibilities and their paid work and the way that they, that they manage that. All right, I think I've just got one more slide. So part of thinking about all of this was to get us to think about, well, why does this matter to thinking about the future of work? What the pandemic is a very significant moment in, I guess, in a lot of people's lives, but particularly in the lives of younger workers has shown that health, stress, economic security and gendered care work are all intertwined. And we need to, need to kind of think about the future policies around recognising all of those factors in the nature of work. We also need to be wary of generalising to all women workers as a homogenous whole. Instead, I've tried to just break it down by contrasting two very different sectors of work, but it's also getting us to focus on change that's happening within work, the industrial organisation and technological context that are making work look different for a new generation of workers and also moving into the future. So we need to be thinking about both precarity and work intensification at the same time and thinking about the impact that's having on the lives of workers. We also need to be thinking about how those who have complex care and responsibilities are supported within work or how they're planning for their future planning for future care and responsibilities is integrated into their workplace. So and I guess my normative bit at the end is that good jobs that have fair and secure futures have a, are good for society. They have an equalising social effect and are, um, are broadly um, something we need to, I guess, bring much more deliberately into our conversation as Lyndall Stradson em emphasised this morning as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Ariadne. That was a really... Um really useful conversation and a, a really quick gallop through some of the data. And as you say, women aren't a homogenous whole and we need to constantly remind ourselves of that. Um, can we stop sharing your screen now? Yes. And, and as you do so, I will introduce us all to Martin Hare, who's just managed to join us um, after having navigated challenging work and family um, balances. So thanks, Martin, for really persevering with us and for, for getting yourself here for us. We're really very grateful. Uh, and we're also grateful that you were here at, at all, given your position. Um, we're really glad to have you here speaking to us as the um, Deputy Secretary for the um, uh, Industrial Relations Group at the Attorney General's Department. Uh, and speaking also as an economist, we're really looking forward to, you, to hearing from you for the last the last speaker of the day about how you see the future of work and what some of the lessons we might have learned from um, the pandemic might be and how you see, I mean, how, how you, where you see the opportunities for movement. I know that we're coming up to an election within the next couple of months and so we can't ask you to be particularly specific about government commitments, of course, um, but your thoughts will be nevertheless really valuable. So over to you, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sally. Can I just check that you can hear me properly? Yes, can do. Great. Um, so, uh, and my apologies for the settings. I'm actually sitting out in the park outside of the hospital where my son's um, having his knee operated on. So I'm hoping everything stays live during this. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to come and talk. And um, you're right, the election's coming up. Um, and in a contested policy space, it's always an interesting thing to be talking about. But what I hope to be able to do is, is talk a little bit about the areas that, we're in, that we'll be thinking about um, when it comes to the caretaker period, what are the things that we're going to try and draw out for an incoming government? Um, so let, let's go back a bit though. Um, so the pandemic really shone a light in the pressures experienced by working parents, both those who had to work from home and care for their children at home, i.e. school-aged children, um, but also um, other, uh, other um, carers in terms of those who weren't able to work from home had to keep um, being able to get to work. Um, often while they, um, 
the children were either needed to be schooled um, or looked after in some way as well. What was really interesting from my perspective was we saw a really rapid shift in our working habits. It's not something that I've seen in my 30 odd years of work, a really, really quick change. Um, that, that need to keep things going really drove innovation very, very hard. Um, and so that was in one way really affirming to see that actually under pressure we can change things, we can look at things differently. But there was still a lot of pressure and a lot of issues with that change. We know that women were disproportionately impacted um, by the, the change, particularly um, in areas where there were lockdowns. Um, with the, the figures from the Household Impacts of COVID-19 survey from the ABS, demonstrating that women were twice as, were nearly twice as likely as men to spend 20 more hours a week on unpaid caring and supervision of children. So about 28%, 28% compared to 15%. So what we saw was um, women in particular taking on the bulk of additional parenting, schooling and caring responsibilities throughout the pandemic. So really good that um, we saw the move to allow people who could work from home to work from home, but lots of concern about the additional workload um, and whether that was being shared fairly. Um, interesting what we did see, um, and certainly within the public service context, we saw employers responding to that need for more flexibility. We saw the Fair Work Commission, we saw employers, we saw unions all join up to try and figure out how can we be more flexible? What can we do differently? And again, I think that's a really valuable thing to see that in times of crisis, um, where everyone can actually adopt and move from quite in trans intransigent positions into a much more flexible approach. So in a relatively short space of time, we saw a transformation in how business and society as a whole approached flexible work. Um, particularly with the concept of work from home. So we're pretty good at part-time, we're, we're pretty good at um, a range of flexibilities, but this work from home, this greater trust um, was really good to see. Um, and, and I think wherever possible, we need to remember that people delivered on that trust, um, which is a really important thing. So people were able to actually deliver on and people were able to see the work being delivered. So that, that rapid transition with the use of digital technology, the growth in trust and, and the ability of people to, to deliver on that trust, I think were really important things to, to see coming out of that. Um, but let's um, have a look at perhaps a slightly longer term timeframe. So what we've seen broadly is women's participation um, increase over, over the last few decades. It's, and particularly with younger cohorts, we see a really strong uh, increase. We, we still see disconnection um, more common from women, particularly around childbearing ages. Um, but even with even um, from the start of COVID through to where we are now, we've seen an increase in women's participation where they've moved from 61.2% in March 2020 to 61.5% in December 2021 may not sound a lot, but 0.3 percentage points participation rate is actually quite significant. Um, what we saw during COVID, um, and my apologies because I haven't seen most of the previous speakers, however, was that women bore the brunt of that disconnection. Being in part-time jobs, being in um, casual jobs, we saw a greater, a greater drop in women's participation during the actual um, like shutdown than we saw elsewhere. And I think it's a um, a concern for us to be thinking about, well, how do we manage that better? What we've also seen is a reduction in the gender pay gap from 17.3% in November, 2013, down to 14.2%, um, which is again, uh, still some way to go, but a significant improvement. Uh, so, from my, so despite these gains, there still remains persistent challenges to women occupying the workforce to the capacity of their choice. And choice and, um, and power is something I'll talk about a little bit later. 
we're still concerned that women carry the majority of the burden of unpaid caregiving responsibilities at home. Um, and as I've already mentioned, they continue to do so through the pandemic. We know that for those aged uh, 20 to 74 years, employed women are almost three times more likely than men to be working part-time. For parents whose youngest dependent child was under six, um, three in five employed mothers or 60% worked part-time compared to less than 10% of employed fathers. Um, we also have women's lower levels of earnings and overall lower levels of workforce participation having significant impacts on the welfare and economic security of women. And, they also, and that also impacts on social cohesion and the economy more, more broadly. So I agree quite strongly with the final point from Ariadne. And for some of that, it's hard to know why. And, and this is where I think there's a genuine question about choice. Um, is this a societal expectation? Is this a genuine choice that women are making um, when they're entering lower paid jobs or part-time jobs or um, casualized jobs? The, um, for me, some of this is drawn out where um, looking at some of the figures around uh, some of the sectors. So for example, in the financial and insurance services sector, Gender reputation is actually quite balanced. It's 52.4% men and 47.6% for women. Um, these are November 21 figures. However, the pay gap is pronounced with men um, earning on average around $17 an hour more than women. Um, so $61 compared to $43 or 42% more. Now that's ABS figures from 2018. So that might have changed a little bit, but you can see that that's a massive difference in the one sector where we've got pretty close to 50-50. Um, so one of the things that, that we're very interested in is that access to greater workplace flexibility in terms of work times, patterns and locations has been shown to increase workplace participation for both men and women. So we see a real opportunity here for um, employers and employees to actually think differently about how um, they wanna work. And a real opportunity in a really tight employment market for employers to distinguish themselves and to make themselves an employer of choice. For, um, we're quite interested in following up on some of the on some of um, the outcomes from the pandemic. It's um, a great natural experiment in some ways. So, what was the impact for parents? Um, Recognising was a lot of the load was or a majority of the load was carried by by women of switching between the two of work two roles of working and parenting throughout the day. Sometimes doing it concurrently, but often having to switch from one to the other. Or, cho or choose to work later into the day. Um, so while I think there will have been circumstances where that will have been a positive impact, I also think there will be circumstances where that will have been a negative impact. So we're really quite keen to follow up on what we see happening there. Um, what we do feel very um, is clearer is that there will have been a positive effect of providing flexibilities for um, to allow businesses and employees to work out the best arrangement to suit the needs of both. So the changes that were made to um, the awards um, in the early part of the pandemic to actually say, take out some of the um, more restrictive um, rules, recognizing those rules are there for a reason, to actually allow some negotiation and flexibility from both the employer and the employee's perspective, I think was really important. Um, and very keen to make sure that we look at that, but recognising the need to make sure that's, that is done in a way where the power in the relationship is as balanced as, is balanced as best as we can possibly make it be. Because there is, there's always that question of where does the power and making sure that a negotiation is even. Um, so a really perhaps a, a nice example was um, KPMG and Deloitte expanded their flex policy to allow staff to work from anywhere. So including overseas. So to combine with a visit 
uh, to friends or families abroad, when travel is something that people are def desperately wanting to do, this policy shift has um, the potential to become quite a powerful staff retention tool. You know, you can both go and see your family and spend an expended overseas and spend an extended period of time with them, but at the same time, you can keep connection to your job. Hopefully you're also thinking about the important point of taking a job or a holiday as well, because that's equally important. Um, we know that employers and employees are still negotiating, experimenting and adapting to see what works best for them. But we do know that women are more likely to face the challenge of working from home while parenting. So any policy settings will need to respond to these practices, issues, and also look at the opportunities that are emerging. So one of the things that I sort of work hard on my team is, you know, one of the um, important aspects of the industrial relations system really has to be seen to be about productivity. Um, and, and I certainly see an opportunity in the post-COVID world from what we've learned during COVID to improve productivity. So the, when we talk about productivity growth, we often talk about, um, you know, it is a key driver of economic growth. It leads to improvements in living standards. Um, but we are a little bit concerned that it's slowed in Australia, as well as across the international um, uh, the international economy more broadly. So from our perspective, we do need to examine new approaches to improve sustained growth. And, and here we think we've got um, things that we can look at. We, we typically talk about um, productivity growth being improved through maintaining a stable macroeconomic um, environment, uh, improving capabilities, particularly through better technology and having the right incentives in the economy to, to name a few. But one of the areas we're very interested in is that productiv productivity growth can also be improved by cooperative workplaces and flexible and responsive work arrangements. And in this context, flexible working practices can be achieved by employers and employees working better together. So working from home practices during the pandemic have brought the benefits of avoiding commutes. And for some, they may also assist in balancing parenting duties and work duties. However, some workers may feel less productive working from home than in an office environment. As we look to the future of work, business and employees will learn more about how to best utilize the flexibility of working from home effectively to increase productivity. So for me, that's a really um, uh, true reflection. So I know that um, my, uh, my wife and myself, we worked from the office during COVID. Um, she was in a, in a health team and I was um, uh, in the IR group, but most of my staff work from home and a lot of my wife's staff work from home. So figuring out how that was productive for them, but we were able to be more productive in an office environment, sort of taught us both to think about, well, how do you balance and how do you make sure you're able to keep teams working in a remote environment? From an IR perspective, um, one of the key frameworks that upholds the employer-employee relationships is the Fair Work Act, which regulates employment in Australia for up to 9 million people employed under the national system. The Act provides a safety net of minimum standards through the National Employment Standards, several of which comprise rights that promote gender equality, including the right to request flexible working arrangements and unpaid parental leave and um, related entitlements. Since 2018, we've seen some improvements um, in the policy settings to support and promote women's workforce participation. With the Act's been amended to include five days unpaid family and domestic violence leave, improved access to unpaid parental leave for, parenting, for parents experiencing the trauma of stillbirth, premature birth, premature birth or the death of a child within the first 24 months of life, um, flexible unpaid, unpaid parental leave, a statutory pathway for eligible casual employees to convert to permanent employment, um, strengthened anti-discrimination and industrial relations frameworks to address sexual harassment and other forms of sex discrimination in the workplace um, and support for women who suffer a miscarriage by expanding the definition of permissible occasion in the compassionate leave provision to include miscarriage. However, we've got to recognize that they're minima. They're not necessarily the, what, where we want to see um, uh, places for the majority of workers. We, we want to see improvements. So 
And we've got two main tools for that. We've actually got the, um, the, the award system, which is able to have standards um, above the national employment standards, notwithstanding they're also set a minimum, but also bargaining, bargain, so the enterprise bargaining framework. Um, so, and, and what we've seen is that often the Fair Work Commission has been able to lead changes through the award system into the national employment standards. So that's a really important piece um, and an area of some frustration. So in, for me, so in August uh, of 2020, the commission attempted to build on some of the temporary changes introduced during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic by publishing a draft award flexibility schedule that would facilitate further workplace flexibility. This would have enabled employers and employers to continue to respond to challenges quickly, as well as meeting the changing expectations of employers and employees. Uh, this call to action and a subsequent attempt by the Commission in 2021 to encourage stakeholders to consider embedding greater flexibility in a specific award, award wasn't supported by either the employer groups or the union movement. So really, uh, for me, a, an opportunity lost in a place, an independent umpire that can actually um, help change working conditions, improve working conditions or improve work outcome um, through its evidence-led processes. Um, we do, however, see industrial instruments um, at the enterprise level leading real change. So in December of last year, Telstra applied to various own enterprise award, seeking to introduce a range of flexible work practices designed to accommodate work from home and facilitate agreements with employees on things like preferred hours, breaking up work periods and timing of breaks. So while this matter is in very early stages and the impact will be limited to Telstra and its employees, it does provide um, an opportunity for the commission to work with stakeholders to potentially embed some of these flexibilities on an enduring basis. Um, so from my perspective, um, really important, um, particularly in times when the labour supply is tight, that um, employers um, think creatively about how are they going to attract people? And also really important for employers to think about actually what are the arrangements that are going to work for them? And, and how do they reach agreement on those matters? I might stop there. Great, thank uh, you, Martin. I'm running out of time, yep. Thank you, that was excellent. Thanks for that, that summation. Um, we've now got about 15 minutes for questions and discussion, and we've got a few questions there. One I might choose to begin with is, uh, picks up the issue I think that you raised, Martin, about the power differentials between employers and employees and the need to make sure that the flexibilities that we're seeking that will deliver better productivity outcomes uh, will actually meet the needs of both employers and employees and that, you know, that the, the power differentials are addressed. And so picking that point up, I'm, I'm choosing a question from Christy Barlow that says, what major shifts in beliefs and expectations do you think organisations and employees need to make to enable greater access to flexible work and avoid the pressure to force everyone back to the office? So it's a question really about um, adding attitudes, beliefs and expectations. Um, any of our speakers are welcome to have a crack at that. Um, do you want to start? Yeah, why not? Yeah, look, 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 I'm happy to. It, it's part of the reason I talked about trust um, in that we, we, and, and that we saw a really rapid and I think successful move to the work from home um, arrangements. There will still, I think, be... Um, uh, concern or uncertainty in employers' views. Um, and, and that's a discussion um, I think lots of employers are having. But what I saw was um, uh, from my own team and the experience more broadly is that um, people delivered. People worked really hard um, and they produced the products that we need in the time that we needed them. Um, and they learned different ways to um, build the teams um, that I think are necessary for, for um, good product to actually make sure they're able to engage. For me, I think it's really important that em employers don't lose that and employees are able to have the discussion with their boss about actually why is that, is that important. 
I think one of the real um, uh, strengths at the moment is what we're seeing um, is actually a greater um, level of movement between organisations. So employers are now having to fight to attract and retain good staff. Um, so uh, that doesn't happen um, always, but but now with um, you know levels of unemployment we haven't seen since 2008, levels of underemployment that again we haven't seen since 2008, and the movement between employers, um, employees moving between employers, actually starting to head back um, up towards the sort of 2007 and 2008 figures. Um, it's a, it's a little bit more of an employees market to be able to influence. And I think that's really important in terms of embedding some of this, um, embedding that actually people can deliver a really good product. There's a piece there about, um, I think about Australian employers becoming better managers as well. Um, you know, one of the things that are, one of the pieces of information that we look at and, and, and try and do some work around is the Gallup poll, which actually said, Engagement in the US and um, Canada, et cetera, is about 24 or 25% employee engagement. In Australia, it's about 14%. Um, so you can see that um, actually there's, there's things that we could do better in terms of how we get, manage and engage with our staff. So I think there's a real opportunity there. Yeah, Sally, you. if I can jump in on a couple of quick points as well, um, and it's anecdotal, but but what we're hearing is that because um, senior management, often as we know, predominantly men, have experienced flexible work over the last two years, um, there is a shift in attitudes and beliefs within organisations because people who would otherwise not, you know, support it have actually lived it and often quite liked it. Um, so, so there is some sort of cultural uh, elements of the experience of the last two years. Um, but we also think that there needs to be uh, very deliberate actions. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know that women have been more likely to request flexible work. And in fact, a study from Chief Executive Women and Bain showed that men are twice as likely to have their flexible work rejected. So I think employers need to be very deliberate in terms of their um, who's being approved flexible work and what that means for, for the mix in the workplace so that we don't just have all the men in the office and all the women at uh, you know working flexibly. Um, that flexible work can mean more than just not working from the office. It could be, uh, you know, variable starting times. It could be, you know, um, you know, four days a week or, or, you know, there's a whole range of different ways that flexible work can um, manifest and it doesn't just have to be in the office or not. And the other third thing I'd add is, is that um, very deliberate about what, what hybrid looks like if you're working flexibly, if some are in the office and some are not, um, how do you manage that so that there's an equal participation and engagement? Um, I loved an example. I heard that um, one company in the US, one, one Zoom, all Zoom, you know, so you get away, you know, and the people I think will be sitting in their office on, on Zoom meetings because um, we don't want to have that disadvantage of the chatter in the room versus those who are not in the room feeling disconnected. So I think, you know, the cultural shift is happening, um, but there's very deliberate actions that employers need to take to uh, make sure that this is embedded fairly, um, you know, for everyone going forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mary. And I agree with you. I think particularly in the public sector, there were a, a range of really senior leaders who really resisted um, working from home or workplace flexibility who came to the party during the, the COVID situation. And that is a great thing, step forward. However, in my opinion, the, um, the pull of inertia it tends to pull people back. And we're seeing that in the public sector now with people being ordered back into the offices. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to, to really think about and to um, to be prepared. I'm wondering if there might be some appetite for putting in place some nudges, legislative or policy nudges or guardrails to make sure that these the changes and the, 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 the productivity benefits that we've seen through COVID are actually retained because, you know, while, as Martin says, change happens quickly when the, the circumstances are right and the incentives align, um, inertia pulls us back as well. So, and I think um, Cameron had some thoughts on, on that earlier to suggest that, in fact, the bargaining power of people in the precarious employment may actually not move very far. Have Correct. you got any thoughts and on that? 
Yeah, correct. And I guess that's the only counterpoint. I mean, I, I do agree with a lot of what Martin said, and, and there was quite a lot of similarities between our presentations dealing with that knowledge sector of the economy in some respects. But I would caution that there's also uh, a lot of employees and workers in very precarious employment and indeed very precarious work. Um, for whom I don't think those paradigms apply. And, and um, you know, I think the law needs to play a much more active role in driving some of that change. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Marion, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, yes, very, very pleased to hear Mary talking about um, flexible work provisions and, and some of the risks involved. And I just wondered if she might talk a little bit more about um, what proportion of men are taking advantage of flexibility, including part-time work for caring purposes, you know, compared with uh, women. I mean, are these provisions gender stereotyped, you know, uh, as, as things that women take up? so they can fulfill their disproportionate share of, of unpaid caring work. Hmm. Because in the early days, we did see that the men were looking for flexibility for things like, you know, running a marathon or doing something that wasn't care related. And uh, women were much more likely to be doing it, well, almost predominantly likely to be doing it for caring purposes. Have you got any, any updates on that, Mary? So uh, interesting question. Unfortunately, we don't uh, collect that data and we're always looking for new ideas of, uh, without being too burdensome on uh, employers. Um, that's why I've used the parental leave though, because we do know that's directly related to the caring responsibilities in terms of my presentation. So, you know, we do see that there's a cultural shift um, for men taking that leave, um, you know, based on caring responsibilities, um, but we don't have that translation through to, to flexible work, um, perhaps yet. Maybe that's something we can look at. Mm, thank I mean, you. Um, sorry. I was just going to say, so um, in terms of, um, of um, uh, flexible arrangements, part-time is the one that we have, that I've got figures for in, in front of me. And that's where we see 60% of um, employed mothers where the youngest dependent child was under six working part-time compared to less than one in 10 employed fathers. So, and uh, for 20 to 74 year old employed men were almost three times more likely than men to be working part-time, less of a direct um, figure there about the care arrangement. But for me, the one that really stood out was that 60% compared to less than 10% where the youngest mm -hmm. child's less than six. Mm. Yes, and you know, like this, there's, there's a whole range of policy and labour law incentives and disincentives applying here, not least which is the family tax benefit system, right, that, that incentivises a one full-time breadwinner and a part-time worker. And, you know, that has been a bee in my bonnet for 30 years now, 25 years since it was introduced in, under the Howard government. Sorry, Marion. I was, I was just going to, to, to revisit my, my presentation, which, which included the fact that, that uh, an important gender equality indicator for, for the Swedish government is the proportion of, of men taking part-time work for mm -hmm. caring purposes. Mm. Just as yes, an exactly. inspiration for us all. Mm. Exactly. Thank you. Um, now we have a question from uh, Emma. Um, I, Emma can't put it into the into the uh, question and answer as a host, but I might hand over to you, Emma, to ask your question in relation to young parents. Uh, and, and I mean, just for me to add my, my framing around your question, I think that it would be around how do we make a generational change happen? How do we use particularly COVID to create generational changes for, for younger workers and taking that through their reproductive years in particular? How do we how do we encourage them to think differently about this? Because we know they do to begin with, and then again, inertia kind of pulls them back into the traditional frame. But over to you, Emma. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Well, I suppose that's my question, but it's just really picking up on Ariadne's research and Cam's talking about precarious work. And I guess I feel worried about young parents um, facing precarity, not only in work, but in life in general. We know that they face greater sort of housing precariousness than their parents did. And I think young parents as well have other um, forms of vulnerability and need greater support. So I'm just wondering how do we, are there any ideas for how we might try to ensure a more secure working future for young parents? 
Yeah, I think that's a great um, comment, Emma. And I think it's a key discussion that we have to have, even if we we look at what we were um, with retail workers and that there was a significant difference with older workers who are predominantly those workers in decision-making roles, not experiencing disadvantage during COVID. So they're not experiencing the pointy end of um, insecurity, let alone stress within doing their day-to-day -day work because they tend to be in back offices and probably were working from home. Um, so that contrast, I think it's really important that we hear the voices of younger workers in debates and that they're, that their experience is brought in. I think you're really right to link everything to do with having a secure job, starting a family, getting independence from your parents, um, the capacity to buy a house, all of these markers of independence and adulthood are becoming further and further away for this generation of young people. And I think COVID has just um, exacerbated that, you know, and there won't be a bounce back necessarily for particular groups of young people who uh, continue to be in more precarious work. Mm, exactly. Now, look, we are unfortunately at time. I know that we've only just scratched the surface and I think we could keep the conversation rolling for another hour if we had the time, but unfortunately we don't. So are there any really quick final thoughts from any of our panellists before I hand us back to uh, Margaret? Or are you... I'm happy to add, add throw one in um, is just uh, and it's sort of to that point and a number of others is you know I think the tight labour market and you know other um, presenters have mentioned it too is just a fabulous opportunity um, and you know we know uh, people choose jobs on obviously the role and the pay um, but there's also evidence they choose it on the policies and the practices such as flexible work and parental leave um, and so mm -hmm. I think you know in this time there is a uh, you know, a small shift in power in relation to, to what can be determined and, and how companies need to respond um, and to get them to shift in terms of uh, their approach and their practices. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I look from that side of things, there's, there's I have some optimism in terms of, um, um, you know, the, the power to influence and change policies going forward. Thank you. And so, look, I might draw us to a close. We've got a lot of questions outstanding, uh, very good questions. I hope some of them have been at least partly answered in the conversation. And I really just want to point us to Belinda Smith's final comment where she said that she thinks it's really important. We do need to encourage more men to choose to work flexibly and part-time to share in care. But unfortunately, under the current labour market, that means both parents are likely to be in precarious employment. So that's not a step forward for us, uh, even if it is towards parity. So I think, um, you know, for me, I, I think we need to look at, in thinking about the future of work, we need to look at both the labour market, and as you know, Lyndall suggested, there's quite a few recommendations from um, a new harvester case all the way through to thinking uh, more, more about bringing the, any na national employment standards into um, lifting that, 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 that foundation, um, drawing more, more work from the awards system and the bargaining system into the national employment standards, uh, but also thinking about the tax and transfer system, I think that's super important in order to create incentives and to give nudges and uh, messages to families about how that the government and the society sees the priorities for care and work. And then also, of course, um, in thinking about just gender norms and campaigning, I think the government's really dropped the ball on that over the last 30 years. As Marion said to us earlier, she showed us the 1980s examples of, of the sort of work that government was willing to do in those days, and we don't seem to be willing to do it all anymore. So um, I think there's plenty of room for us to do stuff, and I'd love to see us move it forward in a, in a, in a, in a kind of whole package to address all of the different incentives and disincentives. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd like to hand back to Margaret and say thank you all to our panel. It's been a really interesting conversation and uh, I hope that we can continue the, the momentum of this, of this thinking. So thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Sally. Uh, it's very much appreciated. It's been, a, been a, <laughs> a, a fantastic day. We've addressed many aspects of work in terms of gender and new ways of working and thinking about how they interact with society's fundamental task of caring, uh, particularly for children who are unable to look after themselves. While women's engagement in paid work is not a new phenomenon, certainly not in the case of working class women, it's really only in the last 50 years that the feminization of wage labor 
has dramatically changed the workplace profile, not only in terms of gender, but how work is carried out flexibly. So we've considered today the multiple contradictions posed for working parents in caring for their children, a role that has traditionally fallen to women and seen how women are, are often punished by employers when they give birth or take time off to care. They are no longer fit the notion of the ideal worker. And men have never been expected to be hands-on carers in our society. Uh, for a good dad to be a good provider was sufficient. The idea of encouraging fathers to be active carers is a fairly recent idea, uh, but the approach generally has been tentative and uh, a, a softly, softly one, beginning with gender neutral language, such as parental leave, as we've heard. And we fear prescription in the area. We don't have a mandatory use it or lose it policy within states uh, sponsored parental care, uh, as in, in Sweden. So social norms as the ideal worker who is unencumbered, that is one without hands-on caring responsibilities and the hyper-competitive culture uh, that's geared to masculinist success and a feminized stigma, stigma associated with caring all discourage men from working flexibly to care so that we see then uh, a collision of values uh, at the moment but we're working uh, slowly on that. Lindell suggested that we work less, but issues of financial reward, status and competition policy in a neoliberal climate committed to profit making, make implementation challenging. But it's certainly uh, important that we've begun that conversation, which I hope uh, does continue. But there are still vast problems to be resolved. So even before COVID, there were, uh, 500,000 Australian children living in jobless households. 250,000 uh, of them were in single parent and or Indigenous families. So I hope that our conference today has inspired you to wrestle with some of these difficult issues. But our time has come to an end. So when my uh, co-organiser, Emma Graham, suggested that we hold a conference to enhance relations between academia and the public service. That seemed a good idea. That was a year ago, and we thought that the pandemic would be over by now, and we would be able to meet in person. The Attorney General's Department generously funded not only lunch and refreshments during the day, but drinks and canapes at the end. Uncertainty about uh, Omicron and whether people would be prepared to travel to Canberra men switching to an online format. Sadly, the vanilla bean food and drinks order had to be canceled. Instead, therefore, I invite you to raise a virtual glass, not only to the speakers and you, the audience, for your questions and lively interactions, but also to Tom and Temi of the ANU College of Law marketing team have done such a sterling job behind the scenes in keeping everyone on track so well for an entire day. So it is time for me to say thank you all.